Okay. okay. Let me share the screen. Yes. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. And I would like to present today a uh, very recent work that, um, that was done in collaboration with a theoretical and, and an experimental group in the University of Padua. And I would like to start, yes, with the um, why we decided to investigate this problem. And we started with basically the observation that adaptation is an ubiquitous phenomenon, as we all know, in biological systems. They sense uh, different cues in a dynamic and noisy environment, and then modulating their behavior in response, exhibiting adaptation in a lot of different ways. These operations are usually mediated by chemical signaling networks that are internal to these biological systems and span a wide range of uh, scales, both in space and time. So there are different examples that I can give you of this adaptation mechanism. One is uh, bioluminescence, uh, where biochemistry of, um, is coupled to viscoelasticity to control light emission of usually dinoflagellates, or even chemotactic responses, where the modulation of flagellar motors um, happens uh, according to the local nutrient concentrations. And if you actually go at a very different scale, both in space and time, we can also see neural responses as a sort of a, um, adaptation in the mediated by some chem complex chemical signaling networks, where there we have a collective response and also the building of a retrievable memory. Um, of course, um, let me actually uh, start now with a, uh, with a question for you. And if I show you these two examples of adaptation, there are many of them, just, just two examples. Uh, one is for bioluminescence. It's actually light intensity um, with time upon mechanical stimulation of a pyrocystic lunula, which is one dinoflagellate. And the other one is the neural activity upon um, repeated visual stimulation in the zebrafish larva. So these two patterns uh, have striking similarities. Indeed, you see a reduction in the signal up to a certain steady, steady response uh, upon repeated stimulation. Since these two systems are very different and they also span very different spatial and temporal scales, it is actually reasonable to think that biological details of these, that, of these dynamics are not so important to understand this is adaptation behavior, at least why it happens, what is the advantage and what is the functional role of this adaptation. Indeed, this is not a completely new research line in the sense that the topology of chemical signaling networks have been studied. And indeed, theoretically, um, two main architecture have been found uh, that are crucial for adaptation uh, and stationarity in biological systems. However, this kind of structure um, rely on a deterministic description of the dynamics. And there, there are also studies that uh, show how these structures are actually important even beyond the steady state regime. At an experimental level also, the, architect the architecture of several uh, chemical signaling network have been explored. Uh, this case is one of a tumor necrosis factor network, and this is a very simplified version of a chemotactic network. And they are experimentally studied, so we know the reaction happening in this kind of processes. And as you can see, there are specific architecture um, for this kind of networks. So the two questions I'd like to answer is, uh, the first one is, if we actually add chemical reactions and we take into account the fact that these are chemical networks, how this information will expand the range of possible architecture that are crucial for adaptation? And what is the molecular implementation at the chemical level of all these mechanisms that we can see described in this, in this kind of architecture at a deterministic level? One of them might be the negative feedback, the other one might be the role of these three nodes, and so on. So all these kind of uh, minimal mechanisms, how can they can be implemented at a chemical level? I would like to present, indeed, actually, the, the minimal ingredient that have been highlighted in the literature um, that are crucial for adaptation. And the first one, of course, is the presence of a negative feedback. Both in the tumor necrosis factor network and in chemotaxis, uh, we see that there is a negative feedback, and this is very important to drive adaptation in this network. But also in all the architecture that have been proposed, 
there is there is always a negative feedback reaction, which is crucial crucial for adaptation. This is not the only the only uh, ingredient. Indeed, another very important ingredient is the information storage. This is never explicitly taken into account, but actually somehow it, it is um, uh, connected in several works to a certain memory or a system or a certain time delayed effect. And in general, we know from Maxwell Demon lecture, uh, lecture uh, let's say, that information storage is actually important. Uh, both for thermodynamic consistency uh, and to take into account properly of the dissipation of the system. Indeed, without the information storage, we also have no thermodynamic consistency and we cannot take into account properly of the dissipation of this, of this kind of information processing network of if one of these um, chemical, chemical signaling networks. Indeed, also in, chemi in different chemical systems like molecular transporters, and this is one example, it is very important to have one node, and in particular, this is the, these are the two nodes, um, whose activity uh, and whose role is the same as the information storage in a Maxwell demo. And naturally emerge also a third ingredient, which is the fact that the system has to be out of equilibrium. So some energy is required to process information and to acquire this kind of information to um, adapt eventually. So now um, let me start with, with the proposal. And actually, this is the model we proposed that encapsulates these three ingredients. So non-equilibrium conditions, negative feedback, and information storage. Of course, we need to have a receptor. The receptor um, has the role of sensing the environment and somehow um, acti is activated by, by this environment. The activation of this receptor will activate in turn um, the, um, uh, the production of a readout population. And the role of this population is to encode the message and the signal from the environment and eventually to exhibit adaptation upon repeated stimulation. And there is also a third uh, population, which is actually the one implementing this information storage. Everything here is chemical. So we always look at the system in terms of a chemical population and nothing else. But the role of this, of this population here is to uh, basically store some information and apply the negative feedback on the receptor, inhibiting further activation when some information is already present in the network. Before um, going on, I would like to, to point out that this kind of structure, uh, which is actually now a chemical structure, and share, it shares some similarities with the architecture that have been found to be crucial for adaptation, but most importantly, it, it shares striking similarities with real biological signaling networks. Uh, if you look at chemotactic network, TNF signaling, and olfactory sensing, they all have one negative feedback part, a chemical population that implements the storage, or a chemical population that implements the readout, and also, of course, a receptor, all of them. And if we actually try to scale up our system, also, in neural response, at least in the, in the uh, visual circuit for um, uh, sensory adaptation in zebrafish larvae, we can also can um, somehow cross-grain the network to reconstruct the same architecture uh, at the level of a neural response. So this observation hints at the fact that these three ingredients are actually, are actually the crucial ingredient to build a minimal chemical architecture uh, to have adaptation in, in uh, a chemical network. Um, I would like to detail uh, now the actually the, the how this network has been constructed, and the first part is the receptor dynamics. So of course this follows um, um, chemical network is a chemical network with two different pathways. These are these are just coarse grain version of more complicated pathways responsible for sensing the environment and applying negative feedback. And here, the, the role of the environment is just to apply an energetic driving that brings the receptor from its passive state to an active state. And, we, and since the system is fully thermodynamic, we can quantify also um, how, does, how much the system is out of equilibrium and what is the energy dissipated per unit temperature in the system. And of course, is uh, proportional to the, um, the energy uh, of activation given by the environment. The activation of the receptor, uh, it's important to note here that an effective distribution can be maintained, even if it's an equilibrium-like distribution, can be maintained only at a cost. Because as long as we have a certain environment, we have an energetic driving and system will keep cycling 
along this along this cycle we along in these two pathways so the activation of the receptor when the signal arrives will stimulate the production of this readout population which follows a chemical birth and death process and indeed the, we have an activation potential this activation potential is reduced uh, when the receptor is active it's basically a reduction in the energetic barrier to produce a readout uh, a readout, a readout molecule it's important to know that compatibly with biological observations, the dynamics of this readout population is the fastest one in this network. For simplicity, we assume an unlimited population of molecules here. And this chemical, uh, chemical birth and death process is coupled also to the storage population. So we also have uh, that these readout molecules catalyze the production of a storage molecule. And these storage molecules are responsible for the, the buildup of the information and the creation of a, of a finite time memory and eventually the application of a negative feedback. Again, this is a chemical birth and death process catalyzed by the presence of, of the readout population. And it is also possible to show that uh, without the, that this, um, uh, this uh, population that implements the information storage has to be slow, or at least its dynamic has to be coupled with the external field. Otherwise, we will see no adaptation. And if we, have, if we assume that we have a slow dynamics because it's necessary, we also see that it's necessary to have an, another degree of freedom, which is usually not observed, that implement this kind of information storage. So we cannot have the, that readout population will apply directly the feedback to the receptor. This will lead to no adaptation at all. And this can be actually analytically proven. So in the end, we have a, an emergent timescale separation. And with this timescale separation, we can write down the master equation uh, dominating the, uh, the, the governing the evolution of the system, including the evolution of receptor, without population, storage, and also the evolution of the external environment. And we can fully solve analytically this kind of, of complete master equation with the standard state separation approach. But before going on with the, with the result, I would like to, uh, to present the, the important variables that we look at uh, to quantify adaptation. The first one, of course, is the reduction of the entropy, which is due to the fact that this, the, um, uh, the readout population is encoding some information about the signal. And as usual, in information thermodynamics, it is quantified by the mutual information. We can do the same for the storage. And applying a, a well-known inequality in information theory, we can also quantify the effect of the feedback. So how much the presence of S will favor the encoding of information in the entire system. So how much effective is the fact of having a, a storage population that um, perform this negative feedback? Let me go to the result now. And indeed, as you can imagine, uh, this system, when you have a, a repeated stimulation, uh, in this case periodic, but it's not uh, actually a, a requirement, uh, we see an adaptation in the readout population. In particular, we see that actually after a first uh, a steady state response, which is very high, then this response will decrease in time up to a certain steady state level. And of course, we see an increase in the storage population in turn, because the system is collecting more and more information about the systems. What is crucial here is that usually only the readout population is observed in, in experiments. Um, the unexpected part of this result is actually that this kind of adaptation is accompanied by uh, an increase in the mutual information that the readout population is um, collecting about the signal. And indeed, we see that an increase of the mutual information, or if you want a reduction in the, in the entropy of the, of the readout population as the adaptation goes on. And this is also, um, at the same time, this is also accompanied by a reduction in the dissipation which is um, of, of, to produce all the internal molecules that we are studying. So the system, of course, has to dissipate some energy to produce both the readout population and the storage population that in, in here actually are responsible to create a certain memory. Uh, but this, uh, the energy required for this production reduces in time as the adaptation um, goes on. 
In this, we can actually conclude that there is a twofold advantage that emerge from this very simple chemical network, very simple architecture uh, of, uh, of adaptation. The first one is to increase the information of the system, and the second one is to reduce the internal dissipation uh, to create all the molecules that actually we are actually considering. Of course, uh, all this effect um, is uh, constrained by the fact that we are uh, building a certain finite time memory, a chemical memory in the systems. And indeed, if two signals are too far away in time, we will see less and less adaptation, and indeed, at some point, no adaptation at all. And this is also compatible with several observations in this kind of chemical systems. In case of bioluminescence, in the end, after 24 hours, uh, the system we recover um, in total is its ability to respond to a certain to a certain stress, and in the end, if the signals are too far away in time, you will see no adaptation at all in the response. This is just one example, but there are several of them. Of course, it would be nice to understand what is the uh, the optimal phase space in the regional parameters when when the system operates, and to investigate this part. We started uh, with a we started with a, a constant field. So in the case of a constant field, we only see uh, a steady state adaptation and not really a, a dynamical uh, an information dynamics in the system. But it's actually useful because in this context of a static signal, we can maximize the adaptation performance, which is encoded in, in both in the storage in the feedback performance and also in the mutual information, while minimizing the dissipation uh, of the receptor to have this kind of adaptation. So if we find the, uh, the Pareto-like surface that can be identified in the, in particular in the region of uh, beta and sigma that quantify, beta is of course the usual inverse temperature and sigma is the activation potential of the storage population. We can then ask ourselves what happens when we actually now have um, a periodic field. So now this, this, this surface is just a static of optimal behavior of the system. Uh, it might be not informative at all about what happens during a, a dynamics. What actually we observe is that adaptation itself is optimized around this gray area, which is indeed the static Pareto-like surface. So we have that the system actually exhibit an optimal adaptation um, around the, the, the static optimal curve. There are also regions in which we see no adaptation at all, but, but it's very uh, crucially, these regions are characterized also by a detrimental effect uh, of the feedback on the receptor or an increase in the dissipation of the chemical processes. So this means that actually the two features that uh, we highlighted, the reduction in internal dissipation and also the efficacy of the negative feedback are actually crucial uh, to have adaptation. In, indeed, when one of the two uh, is missing, we'll see also no adaptation at all in our system. We can finally also conclude that um, we, in this uh, studying this optimal, um, the optimal performance of the system in the, in the space of beta and sigma, uh, we can see that in the low noise condition, when the thermal noise is actually low, uh, we need the higher dissipation to, uh, to overcome the energetic barrier, of course, because thermal, thermal noise is not enough to overcome them spontaneously, but with the higher dissipation, we'll also get a higher information gain, and so a higher adaptation performance, while in close equilibrium conditions where thermal noise is actually strong enough to, to let the system to overcome all the energetic barriers by itself, um, a very low dissipation is sufficient to have adaptation, but the information uh, gain is actually smaller because it is somehow hindered by, uh, by thermal noise. So this means the higher dissipation is important, especially in low noise conditions. I would just like to conclude by scaling up uh, this model, and this is just the final part. Uh, basically, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, our chemical structure and our minimal ingredient can be also identified in a, in, for neural response to visual stimuli of the fish larvae. Indeed, we can actually scale up our model, uh, building a neutral theory to generate a, a, a raster plot for uh, neuron activation without implementing any neural dynamics. Here, everything is just chemical uh, with the minimal ingredient I, I exposed before. And we can actually reconstruct uh, in, a, in a pretty, with a pretty good agreement, the adaptation features 
um, of this neural system. In the end, this is actually hinting at the fact that this minimal architecture is enough at least to capture the adaptation dynamics. And of course, biological details are, are uh, necessary to capture also how this adaptation is achieved in time and how the dynamical response happens. Um, for this, biology, biology is important, but to understand and capture adaptation, in particular to, to have an idea of its functional role, we only need apparently uh, just three minimal ingredients. And this is our proposal is just one of the minimal architecture to condense and encapsulate these three ingredients. Of course, it's not the unique one, uh, but it's one we proposed in, uh, especially because it shares similarities with uh, real chemical networks. This is just a conclusion. So basically, uh, from chemical modeling, we, are, we were able to extract the entire dynamical, uh, dynamical, inform, inform, dynamical information processing features. So how they evolve in time uh, during a certain modulation of a, on a certain signal. Um, this chemical modelization also allows to quantify noise and also to consistently quantify dissipation and uh, to define the reduction of entropy in a self-consistent way. Uh, it comes, the rotation comes with a twofold advantage. It's actually a new result that hints at the functional role of this adaptation. And the final part of this talk highlighted also how this minimal ingredient might be valid across multiple biological scales. So if you want to learn more about, about the, the, this work, there is also a preprint and this is the QR code associated to it uh, recently appeared on the archive. And thanks for your attention. Okay, okay thank you, Daniel, for this uh, nice talk. Uh, I think it, there are some questions in chat. Okay, yes, Thomas asked. Thomas, hi, yes. Okay, may I read it? Let me see. Right, uh, well, I can ask. So yeah. okay. The, the point is, um, so you've presented uh, the adaptive circuit having information, and I assume you mean information with some time varying signal in the outside world, right? Yeah. As as a, as like a, a virtue of a, an adaptive circuit, but but my, my experience of adaptive circuits is that the point is to respond to a perturbation such that you return the internal degrees of freedom to a fixed level that is independent of the circuit, independent to the input. And that, that's, that's, that's the story that you kind of have with um, hemataxis models or uh, feedback controllers. Um, and now obviously often they create information in an ancillary degree of freedom as part of that. But is it is it immediately obvious that that having more information in the in the response is is, is like a good thing? Okay, so um, I mean, there are, um, I would say there are. Two, I mean, I can uh, I can answer it saying yes. I mean, uh, basically, all also all the the works that have been done in literature basically re, uh, refer to this sort of steady state adaptation where you return to a certain level of activity uh, after the signal. And indeed, this is, I would say, this is also compatible to what we presented, maybe not with this particular architecture. And of course, there are some other architecture that one can consider that might have different, different kinds of behaviors, of course. And, but how we quantified, I, I, I don't know if it's actually connected to the fact that the system is acquiring more or not information about the environment, because the way we quantify the information is just looking at the chemical population. And basically, if you see this kind of patterns, it seems that there are some other of them. It seems that basically the, the population keeps adapting and keeps reducing its, um, the, I mean, the amounts of population that is activated over time. So these data, we can't, like from these graphs, we can't tell what the information is with what, right? But, but in, in your model, in your model, yeah, you have, information between what like here are your degrees of freedom what's the information between u and h so we can't i can't tell what h is from this picture so what what's h and you i am not sorry yes h is just the external field so it's this uh, basically this is this this periodic stimulation and u is the and u is the, is the instantaneous readout. readout yeah okay so all right, so information between the instantaneous readout and the 
and the environment. Okay. All right. So it might, might be not the usual way that people look at information in, in, in this sense, but in this case, it's information in the sense how much this response is correlated with the, um, the time evolution of the signal, which is basically what you're quantifying. You are comparing the, the joint distribution with respect to the two marginalized ones in the end. Because one, one might argue, why, why I should adapt? Why it should be important that I adapt in the systems? And I mean, one thing is, is that the system is actually responding in a more correlated way with respect to the signal. This is, if you want, it is just a, a very complex measure of correlation, more, comp more complete than correlation, but it's just in the end a complete measure of correlation between read that population and this kind of field. But so, but why, so this is showing that over time, the information increases, yeah. right? Yeah. But it, it's, this graph is not showing itself that having the, having the negative feedback is helping you have more of that information. What, what's the control curve okay. if you have no uh, negative is, feedback? This is not showing the effect of the feedback. Actually, I didn't say it, but the delta i is actually the effect of the feedback. And so indeed it is how much the knowledge of S uh, in, um, favors the collection information of the readout with respect to the field. So the more you know S, the more you can actually um, uh, obtain information about this and about, about the field. I also, and also if I cut the storage part, if I completely eliminate the storage and I completely eliminate the feedback, of course I have no adaptation at all. But if I also implement the feedback, directly through the receptor, I also have no adaptation at all. And you, I mean, the system is completely solvable, so you can, you can prove it analytically. There is there's no adaptation at all if we eliminate, basically, sorry. Uh, this well, I'll tell you what, problem. let's maybe get into this a bit more because it's the discussion after this, right? So yeah, yeah, sure, sure. there's another question, so. Uh, yes. Yeah. Which I think is Peter Ryan. Uh, I have a question, but I was uh, waiting for the chair to point in my direction. Um, well, my question is actually very similar, um, but maybe I can start with a statement, with a question. So do you think that adaptation in general enhances information transmission? Uh, okay, this is actually a, a question to which I don't know, I uh, don't know how to answer. Um, in the sense that um, in this kind of context, at least for the kind of observation that we wanted to, to somehow understand, I would say that this, uh, the adaptation of response in time increase the information that is shared or if you want the correlation between the readout population and the field. It might be not always the case, and in particular, I don't know what happens if we change the chemical structure of each building block, or if we change the architecture, keeping the same building blocks, we change the architecture or how the feedback is implemented. Because, because, what, might... I would, because what I would say, right? So I think it depends strongly on, uh, on the dynamics, the statistics of the input signal. And it depends strongly on what you want to measure, right? So if the input signal is, let's say, an ornstein uhlenbeck process, a Markovian signal, then you can show that the optimal network is one that just copies the input signal instantaneously into the output signal. Um, right? That maximizes sort of the instantaneous uh information um is this thing, is this thing true also in the presence of our storage of an of an uh, but, but but yeah so but that but then the push pull network would suffice right so a push pull network is basically a simple copying device and that works however the, the if you are readout that you have is that it's effectively a push pull readout right exactly i think so yeah. we can ask uh uh daniel. It's, a birth, it's a birth death catalyzed yeah by exactly birth. right so i so I, I i would think so but maybe daniel can correct us but i uh, right so your readout is essentially a push-pull network right i mean it, it it basically remembers the past signal no 
the readout here uh, is uh, uh, here the dynamics. Basically, the readout here is just a, a birth and death process. So I don't know actually if this is what you yeah. meant. I think yeah, it is. It's, yeah, it's, I, active, it's, it's, so it's pushed it, up by the thing being active more exactly. than when it's inactive. Exactly. Sure. Yeah, kind of. I mean, exactly. maybe the crucial the crucial point here is that the readout population is actually fast. So in the sense that it reached steady state immediately when the signal arrives. This did, you, did you put that in uh, a priori or did it come out of an optimization? No, this was put a priori, uh, but actually we checked that it was not a crucial assumption and it was put, I mean, in the sense that actually the system works more or less the same way if we relax a little bit this assumption and perform a Gillespie simulation um without this without this assumption this is actually was of course important to solve the system analytically but the gillespie would, would agree uh not with an infinite uh, adaptation mm -hmm. and of course we so we also put this assumption uh mm -hmm. because in several systems actually we know the time scales of these dynamics and the time scale of the readout usually faster with respect to the one of the storage so there was somehow inspired some observation but we put this a priori and we checked that it actually was compatible with uh, a relaxation of this assumption. Of course, we cannot relax totally this assumption in the sense that if the readout is adapting at the same time as the storage population, we can we have a, an entire network. Uh, I don't know exactly now what it is, the readout, what it is, the storage, and what actually is what we are observing in this case. Maybe it goes more in, in, in direction of what you're saying. Actually, I agree. Depends on what you are observing and what is the adaptation in your kind of system. Then maybe this might 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 have different consequences in uh, if the information is always maximized during adaptation. This is the, this I, I strongly believe. For example, that in the case of bioluminescence, when in when the, the storage is actually somehow connected to the readout because it's, it's only implemented by a certain finite capacity of the molecular network. Because at some point you have no molecules. To, uh, perform, to have light emission. In this particular case, I don't know if this information between readout and field is actually maximized over adaptation. Probably some other quantity that is uh, somehow maximized or optimized during adaptation, for which adaptation is actually important and not well, necessarily so one that I, that I mentioned. Yeah, so I, I would say, right, so adaptation, uh, as Tom pointed out, is often, um, uh, discussed or studied in the context of the systems that have to reset to a particular uh, value. But of course, systems that adapt, they also have this inherent capacity to predict derivatives, right? And so if you have a signal with some inertia, and if the system wants to predict the derivative, as for example, an E. coli uh, chemo Texas system, I think, wants to do, right? We argue that it basically needs to uh, uh, predict the derivative. It just wants to know is the concentration rising or is the concentration falling, uh, right? And and this is really a derivative taking question. Then an adaptive system can can be useful, right? Because you basically compare the the current signal with the signal further back into the past, um, right? And so in that context, the, the adaptive systems can show up. But it really depends on what the system wants to measure what it wants to predict and what the statistics of the signal itself are right and so i yeah. so and i think in general yeah in many cases push pull networks suffice and only in specific cases you you need a more specific system like an adaptive system yeah and also uh, let me also mention that in this kind of, of case we didn't consider motion of this of this sensing unit Mm. So uh, everything is somehow fixed in space because mm. we were we had in mind essentially the the experiment that I shown about the zebrafish larva basically, and so everything was fixed in space. So there was there was no motion there. But actually, uh, a next step would be to add, and, and this actually we're working on this to add also the spatial degrees of freedom. This might change a lot the picture actually. Uh, also because at some point you have a dynamics that somehow is driven by the changes in the information or in the changes of the nutrient concentration. I don't know if these two are exactly related. It's not so trivial to understand if actually a change in the information, an increase or a decrease is immediately related to a change in the local nutrient concentration. And if this kind of 
of structure uh, is enough or it suffice to describe what we are observing in chemotaxis because it's a network in which you also have a spatial degree of freedom. It's something that is not included in these models. So I'm not so, let's say, confident in um, um, extending this to chemotaxis uh, formally, at least in the sense of the observation about chemotactic responses. But can okay. I, can I, if we go to your system and uh, so let, if you assume that you had a very slowly varying environment, yeah. so that the environment varied slower than the negative feedback, the, the, the base signal, obviously the receptor signal would fluctuate. The, mm -hmm. the, um, would you think that having the negative feedback would increase the information between. So this this graph doesn't help us very much because you've got very you've got a rep, very rapidly varying signal. Yeah. So we also uh, this was basically to show the I mean to have a nice picture. Uh, we also I mean basically what up, this is what happens when you have a slow. Uh, I mean a, a lot of posts within one thing and another. So in the end, in this kind of building the model, uh, the, the memory somehow, or if you want the effect of the storage, it's uh, of, as a finite time because it's yeah. a chemical memory. So of course, if you, if you, if you have a longer pauses between signals. But I'm not really talking about, I'm not really talking about pulse signals. I'm saying, imagine you had like a flat signal, which could then change to another value and then change to another ah, okay. value, right? So, okay. so you effectively, what I'm saying is, You've effectively got a system that is responding to effectively constant signals, which do vary on some very slow time scale. Okay, but so slow that all of the dynamics of the downstream network reaches a steady state. Yeah. Do you think that the negative feedback thing that you've got will increase the information between H and the signal? ignoring any information that you have in s so obviously if you put s in you put extra molecules in you've, yeah. you've given yourself the capacity to have extra okay, information. that's that's okay there ignoring are two s points. just looking at h would the negative information in negative feedback increase your information i'm pretty confident that you would say no it won't it will make your information less there are two Two points I would like to, to mention on this on, on this on this question. So the first one is that if the if the storage um, is also relaxed to steady state because the signal is too slow, so the answer is no, in the sense that everything is steady state. So you have no really a negative feedback that dynamically works. In, in in this way you have just one steady state for the entire network yeah the gain goes to zero right i mean your gain just goes to zero i mean if you adapt on time scales that are shorter than the time scale on which the signal changes then on that time scale the response goes the response magnitude goes to zero and then the mutual information also goes to zero right so I think this only this only works if the peak of your frequency dependent gain of your network if that matches the frequency of the input signal. This works yes I mean this, this works when the storage molecules have a dynamics which is in in terms of time scales coupled to the one of the standard signal. Yeah. Otherwise everything reaches basically a steady state and you have no really dynamical adaptation in, in this sense I showed here. That's that's the point. So it's crucial that the dynamic of the storage has to act more or less on the same time scale of the external signal. That's for sure. Another thing, which is uh, actually I would like to mention in answering this question, is that this I, U and H, is already the mutual information shared by U and H with no uh, information about S at all. In the sense that S is in the system, of course, the storage is in the system, but here we are just comparing, sorry, uh, we're just comparing the um, joint distribution of U and H with respect to their marginalized distribution. So we are not really look, uh, looking at the 
um, the effect of S. I mean, the effect of S is there, but it's in, it enters in an integrated way in this kind of observable. Of course, we can study even U and S with H or some other quantities. Nothing changes so much. Um, but the nice thing is that even integrating out the effect of S, still we see some increase in, in U, which was actually quite unexpected for us. This is, this is a and this, and a these, graphs, of these graphs, in some sense, I'm not saying they do show this, but if you just had a transient dynamics of U with respect to H and no S, they would also show an increase in the information over time, I suspect. Right. Yeah. So the key, the key comparison is not to say that the information increases over time. The key comparison for the, to prove the adaptation is doing something in this regard is to show that if I cut the S circuit out. So is that what the red is that what the bottom delta I is? What's delta I? Uh, this is this quantity here and probably I uh, yeah, it's delta I F actually is this part here. So we, I mean, of course, we cannot cut this the the storage. I mean, that's something probably that is missing in this in this picture here is that every point here is a steady state. So every point here is a, is actually a steady state. I mean, okay, yeah, yeah, because you assume it's a very fast response. Yeah. So okay. that's why I'm using this kind of uh, quantity here because we cannot I mean every point here is a steady state. So it's not a it's not it's not just a transient. But ED majors. Yeah. Okay. In storage, yes. no. mm. yeah, maybe it was this was not clear at the beginning, and I'm sorry about it, but no, it no, no, no. it's, it's not fair enough. That's, that's, yeah, okay, so it's it's not just a transient of of H because H is reaching a steady state, yeah, yeah, everything, so everything it's, 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 it is, it is, a, it is the, the integrated effect of the transient of S, yeah, exactly, um, and that is apparently increasing the mutual information due to some frequency dependent effect basically yeah, yeah. Okay. are there any other question in the chat because i yesterday when i looked at the chat but it was yeah i think there are some adding question in chat mm -hmm. Thank you anyway. Sorry for being. Ah, no, you're welcome. Yeah, actually, I'm, I appreciate all these questions. And so they were very interesting. And actually, it also uh, gave me the opportunity to discuss several points that were maybe not so clear or, in general, maybe not um, complete in the, in, in the model, like the spatial part or all these kind of things. So I appreciate it. Uh, okay, uh, I can briefly answer it to the question in the chat if the guy is online. And basically, uh, the answer to the first question is that uh, this this is every point here is a steady state, so it's not like just a convergence. So it's uh, the system which a steady state, and we estimate the model information every time. It's basically what I said. And uh, the other question, one information between some variables and the event system, the driven signal. I mean, this is yes, in the sense that you have a modal information. If you just have a static signal and you let the system relax to a steady state, you have a modal information, of course, because at some point the signal reaches a steady state and this steady state is somehow correlated with the standard signal. Of course, we have some modal information. But the point here is that since each part of this is a steady state, uh, the fact that the mood information is changing in time is, is um, a consequence of the fact that U is reaching a different steady state in time as a consequence of this time integrated effect of the storage population. So it, the answer is yes, we always have a mood information, but the increase of mood information, it's usually not there if you reach a steady state, if you don't have any, another node that implements some kind of transient effect. Of course, otherwise you everything is just this state and you just get a, a value, that's all. And you have no gain in, in, in modern information because it's just a, one value. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are already in the discussion time. Uh, so we have still 
sometimes or are there any question to the speakers there is 